Hello. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about oil recovery, what I call the trillion barrel question. What do I mean by that? There's probably about a trillion barrels of conventional oil that's still to be recovered. And most of that is contained within large carbonate reservoirs, many in the Middle East. And the rock there, having been in contact with crude oil for some time, is oil to mixed wet. And many of these fields are relatively immature stage of recovery, so we don't know for sure how much we're going to get out, out of these fields. But we do know that the principal mechanism is, for recovery is likely to be water flow. The question is, this is a trillion barrel question, how much oil can we recover? Is it going to be efficient? Is it going to be inefficient? So to show that, what I'm going to do is show a schematic of what the displacement processes will be and what we should be looking for for optimal recovery. So we have two principal displacement processes um, if we're going to inject water. The first is rather obvious. You have a, you know, a rock here, water is injected and it pushes out the oil. And that's what's shown schematically there. And that can be anything from the pore scale to the field scale. And where the water goes, you want to have the most efficient recovery possible. And so clearly you want the residual oil saturation to be as low as possible. But you also, in terms of flow, you want the water to be held back in the pore space. So the water relative permeability below, but the oil relative permeability high, so the water, that the oil can flow and be produced. So those are the combinations that you want for water. And so the question is, well, naturally, do we have that combination of features, in which case that's good news? If not, can we design, can we, for instance, modify the composition of the injected brine to push us to that condition? Or do we do, have to do something else? But many of these reservoirs, indeed the majority of these reservoirs, are also fractured. And the fractures essentially provide short circuits for the injected water. So if you have an extensively fractured reservoir where the water just goes along the fractures, what happens here is the water you inject, shown in the darker gray, fills all the fractures. And because it's a, a short circuit, you can't really impose a pressure gradient across, quotes, the matrix, which is the ordinary rock between the fractures. So the only way in which you can get recovery is that the water moves in through spontaneous inhibition and the oil moves out in the opposite direction. Countercurrent spontaneous inhibition in this case. In this case, what you want is you want the rock to be more water wet because then there'll be more spontaneous inhibition because it's governed just by capillary forces. So an oil wet rock, the oil water doesn't spontaneously imbibe, so actually nothing happens. Okay? So you want it to be as water wet as possible. And what limits the behavior is actually the water getting in. The oil is at quite high saturation, so the oil can escape relatively easily. It's the water relative permeability, particularly at low saturation, that you want actually to be as high as possible. It's sort of almost the opposite, actually, of the water flow. Now, we don't know for sure, it depends on the reservoir, which is the dominant mechanism. Is it simply water pushing through the rock, or is it going through the fractures and then having to involve? So it's normally a combination of the two. So I don't have an answer, but let's investigate what that means in terms of fluid flow. So here, what I showed here is a series of curves. I'll sort of put, um, maybe I'll put myself here. Okay. A series of relative permeabilities that have been measured. These are traditional core flood measurements on a sample about this size. Um, on mixed wet uh, rock from reservoirs in Abu Dhabi. Okay. And this has been published in the literature a few years ago. The solid lines show primary drainage. So it's oil moving into the rock. The dash, dash lines that I'm showing here are where water displaces all its so interest. Really cool. The points you see here is at the end of water flooding, you do what a, what's known as a bump flood. You push a lot of water in at a high flow rate to try and get to the one, say the true residual saturation, how much oil is going to be really retained in the pore space. Okay, let's have a, a look at the, that top line of relative permeabilities. And what you find is behavior that you might think is sort of what you'd expect if the rock was oil wet, 
So if it's oil wet, the water goes in the big pores, so you'd expect the water relative permeability to be quite high, to be higher than in primary drainage where the water's wetting things, and the oil relative permeability to be low. And what that would mean is that where these two uh, curves cross, where the two relative permeabilities cross, is about 50% or lower, somewhere in the range here, about 45%. That's bad for recovery. Now, why is it? Where the relative permeability cross, if the viscosities are the same, that means you've got the same amount of flow as oil or water. You get to a higher water saturation, you're flowing more water than oil, which means at a well, you're producing more water than oil, which is clearly uneconomic. So what you want is actually you want this so-called crossover point to be at high water saturation, because that means you've displaced a lot of the oil. You started with an initial oil saturation here that's in the range of about 10%, and you want to move to a very low um, um, oil saturation, a very high water saturation. But you don't get to the true residual, because eventually at the well, what you're doing is you're producing so much water compared to the oil. It's no longer economic to continue to produce. So just as a, a quick guide, this isn't quantitative at all, but as a quick comparative guide, we look at where the relative permeabilities cross. If it crosses at a low water saturation, that means you don't put much water in, but you get a lot of water out. So that's bad for recovery. Right? That's bad news. And that's sort of classically what you might expect in an oil wet rock because the water relative permeability is high because the water's in the big pores, oil relative permeability is low because oil's in the small pores, those curves go to the left. Okay, so that's bad recovery. So the top line is looking bad. Okay, bad news. We need to do something else. The other six, I know I'm covering up one of them, but the other six, actually the other way around. The oil relative permeability also does tend to be quite low. The oil is, is, is in the smaller pores, um, and so you see the oil relative permeability low and, and lower in most cases it is in So that's that kind of sense. The residual saturation, the true residual saturation, is quite low, around 10% or so, and that's characteristic of a mixed wet rock because you've got these oil layers that keep the oil connected. The water relative is very low. That's the curious. The reason is, as explained in a previous video, is this is because at the end of primary drainage, the water is in the nooks and crannies and narrow pores, then becomes more oil wet. The water is essentially peeled and can't move, it can't swell in these layers. It actually has a very low relative permeability, very low flow. And you only get a significant water relative permeability. These are the water relative permeability sort of goes up and bumps up after this bump flood when the saturation, the water saturation, is really very high where it's connected through the big pores. So what we have here is, in fact, good recovery. The crossover point here is more like 60. 65% as opposed to 40%. So we're seeing a difference actually 10, 15, or even 20% um, in the local displacement efficiency, how much you recover from a small piece of rock if the water goes there. So why, if it's to do with the connectivity of the water layers, can we design this process? Obviously we want to be in the good recovery zone. And the implication here would be that many mixed wet rocks where you have oil and water layers of both present may in fact give you this favorable recovery. So do we see this? And when I say see, if we do some X-ray imaging, what do we get? So here is uh, some results um, from our laboratory. And what we're showing here, let's, let's look at the pictures on the right to begin with. So the top layer is quite a raw image, two-dimensional cross-section uh, through a three-dimensional image. Then the second one is, is showing essentially the remaining oil. So you water flood, you've got crude oil in the rock, the uh, surface of the rock has then been so-called aged or changed to um, an altered wettability state, and then you inject water. And what's shown there with the different colors is the remaining oil after the water flood. So how much is left behind? Okay, the first case, WW, is actually more water wet rock, the crude oil went in, but it wasn't given really time to change the wettability. So what you find there is the recovery is not great because in a water wet system, the oil gets trapped in the larger pore space. You get these blobs of the different colors of different trapped blobs. So the recovery there um, doesn't look good. And in fact, here is the oil recovery against the mean contact angle. So the water wet case has a mean contact angle um, just below 80 degrees. So it's not strongly water wet, but it is water. 
Now let's take the oil wet case. This is the second one. Here in blue, essentially the oil is still all connected because it's, there's a strong wettability alteration. It likes the solid surface, so it clings to the solid surface. So what happens is you inject water. The oil flows really slowly, but is retained, stays in the pore space. And so in fact, the recovery is bad. It's even worse. Now it's worse not because the true residual saturation is higher than the water wet case. But if you inject a reasonable amount of water in, in an oil field, you're lucky to inject more than one or two pore volumes. That is, replace the volume of the reservoir once or twice with water. In these experiments, um, this is after 10 pore volumes of injection. But because the oil is flowing so slowly, it just doesn't move. It hasn't, you haven't got rid of it. it. So the recovery is actually even lower than the water wet case. But the intriguing thing is in between the mixed wet case with a mean contact angle of around 90 degrees, so sort of in between water or oil wet. And this is simply because we age in a different crude oil, lighter crude oil, less uh, surface active components, fewer surface active components. So what we got here is at the end of water flooding, the Remaining oil is still quite sheet-like. You've still got these oil layers. And in fact, they've allowed a better connectivity. The water has been held back in the pore space. And so the combination of oil and water layers have actually allowed a very favorable recovery. So this is actually the best. It's the highest recovery is in fact this mixed wet case. So you don't want it to be strongly oil wet, because we showed with the relative permeability in the previous slide, high water relative permeability. Low oil rate, um, so the crossover is low, you basically keep the oil in. Water wet isn't ideal because you're trapping in the large pore spaces. This mixed wet state seems somehow with these oil and water layers to be ideal. So, can we do a little bit more than that? And the answer is yes. Here are some experiments performed by um, two PhD students in my group, Emma and Ying. And what we're showing here at the top is where we do this steady state flow. So this is a two dimensional cross section for a three dimensional piece of rock. Um, it's about five millimeters across, but schematically like this, but this is a reservoir carbonate from Apatol. You've injected to begin with just oil, okay? And what's shown at the top is quotes the raw image. And then we put in some nice colors so we can actually see what's going on. So to begin with, um, we've just got uh, oil being injected. And we've got a small amount of water in the nooks and crannies of the pore space shown in blue, but most of the pore space is red, that means oil. Um, the white is the rock itself. Okay? Then what we do is we increase the amount of water. So we're reproducing in our laboratory a water flood process. The fractional flow is then 15%, so 15% water, 85% oil, 30%, 50%. And then this bottom layer right, is where we go up to just injecting water. And when we inject just water, you can see we get bluer and bluer and bluer. We actually have now water occupying most of the pore space and the oil, because it's mixed with just the nooks and crannies of the pore space. Okay, so just a little bit of oil remaining. So you can see immediately, this looks like a rather favorable displacement. So something uh, water flooding um, is likely to be quite successful in terms of recovery, assuming that we're not heavily fractured. So let's see what this means in terms of relative permeability. So the pictures here are showing the oil phase of different fractional flows. So to begin with, the oil is all connected, all that blue cluster. Then at the resolution of the image, it seems to get disconnected, but clearly there is some flow and it's probably through these layers that are so thin we can't even see them in the image because we, don't have, we can't see layers that are smaller than a few microns. But on the right is the relative permeability with the relevant equation. It's the KR that we're looking at here. And uh, the blue is the water relative permeability that remains quite low. The water isn't well connected because it has to flow through these very narrow layers established at the beginning of primary drainage. And you can see there's a little bit of water in the nooks and crannies. You have to flow through that to get in through the center of the pore space. So it's only at a very high saturation that the water relative permeability increases. The oil relative permeability does fall quite sharply, um, but the residual saturation is quite low here, or the last saturation we get to is less than 20%. The crossover point is about 65%. That's good for it. So if we have a water flooding process, this is just one experiment on one piece of rocks. So I'm not saying it's generally true, but for this particular sample, it looks pretty favorable. If we have a fractured reservoir, however, this would not be favorable. 
because most of the pore space is oil wet, so there would be no spontaneous imbibition. So, that ends the discussion. I don't have an answer to the trillion barrel question, but I do have a physical explanation to understand some rather intriguing recovery behavior, which is that in a mixed wet case, actually you can have a combination of oil and water flows, low residual saturation holding back the water, that can be favorable for recovery. On the other hand, the other extremes, a more water wet case, a more oil wet case, actually give you lower recoveries. Now the question is, yes, what does it mean for a wide range of rocks under a wide range of conditions? And can we try and manipulate the conditions to be in that so-called recovery sweet spot? That is obviously something for future work, but the techniques we have here in terms of the imaging and the measurement of relative permeability combined with some physical insight should help us design these processes more efficiently. So thank you very much. <laughs>